Uh, so energy and matter. Um, these are the fundamentals, the building blocks of um, just everything, you know, everything that we have as far as human beings, our world, our planet, everything's made of um, matter and energy. Uh, so we have some objectives we're going to cover this week. So we're going to explain systems of measurement, differentiate between matter and energy, and give examples of each. Compare mass and weight and give examples of each. Explain relative density, specific gravity. Summarize the relationship between force, work, power. Differentiate between sensible heat, latent heat. Compare the different units used to measure, measure refrigeration effect. Um, there's some things that we're going to cover in greater detail, things that I feel you're going to benefit more from. Other things we're going to just gloss over a little bit more. Um, it's just certain things you may not necessarily come across. Um, for example, calculating different formulas, things like that. Uh, if you really want that, you'll get that better out of a physics class. We're going to be talking about refrigeration. We're going to be talking about um, just how um, refrigerant transfers heat. That's the most important thing for you guys to come away from this class. You know, how, what's the heat transfer? How do we transfer that heat from the building from inside to the outside? Um, what are the components of the refrigeration system? That sort of thing. If you ever want to, you can always come back to the formulas and try to figure it, you know, not figure it out on your own, but you'll have a little understanding, um, but you're not going to really use that too much in the field. If you want, we can discuss that a little bit more. But for the sake of argument, um, we have a system of measurement here in the U.S. Um, we use the standard system. We're going to use the foot. We're going to use the pound. Um, the foot is going to measure your distance. The pound is going to measure your mass or your weight. All right. Um, we also have the international system, and that's going to be metric. Um, you're going to be measuring everything in meters um, or grams. And so there's, it's a really cool system. I sort of like it. I wish we implemented it here in the States. Unfortunately, we're stuck on standard, and that's not going to change. Um, we're, you know, the metric system, if you have one meter, we can add a, a kilo to it, and all of a sudden it becomes a greater unit of measurement, and now we have, uh, what is it, like 1,600, you know, meters to one mile, but, you know, roughly meters, I think, it are easier for me, but regardless, we're under standard, so... Um, the one thing I want to show you guys first off um, when we're talking about systems of measurement, it, it's just being able to read a tape measure, all right? Um, this is something you guys are going to use. So, you know, if we're making duct work, um, we're measuring out pieces of copper, how long do I have to measure it out? Um, we want to be able to read that and transfer um, what we see on a tape measure or a ruler or anything else that we're using and give that to either somebody else or for yourself. Um, if I tell you I need something that's, you know, a piece of pipe cup cut at 10 and 7 eighths, well, you need to be able to understand what 10 and 7 eighths mean. I don't want to get a piece of pipe that's 10 and a quarter. You know, it may be too short for my application. So if we look, our standard measurement is one inch on a tape measure. Um, it's divided by these long lines that are going to break up each inch. In between each inch, we have different tallies, and the tallies are, in this tape measure demonstration, are divided by 1 16th. So bringing up math and fractions, hopefully everybody understands how they work. Well, our, our first little measurement is 1 16th. If I were to add another 16th to it, I would have 2 16ths. 2 divided by 16 is going to give me 1 eighth, and that's how we get this measurement. Then we have 3 sixteenths, quarter, 5 sixteenths, 3 eighths, 7 sixteenths, half, and so forth. And so you can see that everything is differentiated to linearly. So a sixteenth is, we'll say, uh, for the sake of argument, is um, 1 inch on my screen. Your screen may be a little bit different. We're going to come over to 1 eighth. The 1 eighth is a little bit longer than the 1 16th. It just helps you to physically identify um, that 1 eighth marker. Um, we go back to a 16th measurement again, 
it drops back down to that shorter length. We get to a quarter, quarters longer than one eighth, and so we have a longer measurement here. We come back over to the five sixteenths. Back, it's a sixteenth again, so it's a shorter. Then we have another eighth measurements, a little bit longer, sixteenth, and then a half. A half is almost the longest. The only one that is longer would be the um, one that separates the inch marks. Um, so get familiar with this. Um, different tape measures are going to have different markings too. If you really need to get very precise, you can get one that's in 30 seconds. Um, so there would be a line in between the 16th and the um, just the standard zero place. <clears throat> I personally don't think you need that much. If I need to cut something at a 32nd, um, I know that in the middle between these two lines, there will be a little space right here. Right in the middle is a 32nd, so I can easily mark that and make my cut. Um, very rarely do you need to be that precise, uh, but know that it is out there and that's what we usually do. So, so that's our standard systems of measurement. Um, know that we have 12 inches and a foot, um, and then there is three feet in a yard. Um, outside of that, you may find different other systems of measurement that we may or may not use out in the field, but generally it's going to be inches and feet. Um, you can calculate, let's just say you're doing um, a measurement for a room, you're going to be doing a load calculation or you're hanging some a radiator in there or something like that, and you're measuring out the length of the room, you can measure it out in inches, you can measure it out in feet, and then have a certain amount of inches after it. So let's just say it's 10 feet, three inches, you know, or three inches and an eighth. Well, we have that measurement. Or you could do the it's an entirety, just measure it out in inches because your tape measure is going to come in inches and you're going to go 123 inches with, you know, an eighth at the end. So, all right. So now to matter. Uh, matter is the building blocks of the universe, okay? Uh, matter is what makes everything. Um, matter are the little atoms, the molecules that comprise all physical being here on the earth. It's everything we breathe, everything that we can touch, smell. Um, literally, everything is made of matter. Um, there's three different states. We have solid liquid gas. Um, there's plasma, but that's just a weird thing we're not going to cover. But overall, these are the three types of states that we as technicians should know. If we're talking about, you know, something that's solid, um, we'll keep it simple. We're going to talk about water. Water is the most common type of matter um, that everybody can accustom and know the different states. So when we're talking about solid, we're talking about a piece of ice. If we're talking liquid, well, we all know what water is in liquid form. Um, we bathe, we swim, uh, we do all sorts of things. We drink liquid water, and then we have gas. You know, we're going to um, potentially inhale water as a vapor. Um, let's just say we're using uh, like a humidifier or something to open up our nasal passages. We're going to breathe in some type of water. Um, so water in a gaseous form is steam.
All right, I just want to torture you guys with that, so um, good luck sleeping at night. Hopefully that sticks in your guys' heads. Um, but you'll at least understand solids, liquid, gas, the different states of matter. And so we have energy. Um, energy is um, the ability to affect change in matter. Um, it's the capacity to form work. So we have different types of energy that are available. Um, you can't create energy. Um, it's, it's sort of always there. You can't destroy energy, okay? Um, there's different forms of energy that do take place. So we have potential energy and we have kinetic energy. So potential energy would be, for example, like we have a boulder at the top of a mountain. It's nice, it's big, it's ready. It's ready to come off that side of the mountain, but it's not because there's a little pebble there. Well, a gust of wind or something scurries underneath, knocks that pebble away, and all of a sudden that energy starts rolling down the hill. Now we have kinetic energy. You can only change energy from one form to another. You can't just mystically create energy. So we have just a diagram here of energy conversion. So how do we create energy? Well, we have a propane tank. The propane tank is filled with a combustible gas if we apply a flame or heat source to spark that well now we start getting a thermal energy from that propane from that flame burning all the gas we generate heat that heat is applied to water in turn that water starts to boil we take a uh, we do a state change from a water to a vapor, we're creating steam. That steam then goes through into the turbine. The steam starts to spin the turbine. The turbine is then connected to a electrical generator through a pulley system, and the generator starts to spin. Once the generator spins, we then form electricity, and the electricity starts to um, light the light bulb and we have another version of thermal energy. Um, so we have different types of energy here. We have mechanical, thermal, electrical, everything's all working together to um, create an end result. So keep that in mind. Um, this is actually how we generate um, nuclear power, um, real simple. We replace the uh, thermal energy coming out of the propane tank and we have uh, nuclear rods. Nuclear rods boil the water, create steam, and the same premise occurs. Um, you can also use coal, um, natural gas to create that flame, burn the um, water or anything like that. We're taking the energy source out of the coal or anything else that we're burning, which is then gonna t go in turn, spin a turbine of some sort and, and create uh, electricity via the generator. So mass, mass has weight, um, but first off, mass is the quantity of material. So if I have a lot of pennies in a bowl, that's gonna have a lot of mass. If I have one penny in a bowl, it doesn't have as much mass as a lot of pennies. And so there's a greater weight associated with that bowl full of a lot of pennies than if there weren't any. And why is that? Well. We have something that um, on our planet, it's called gravitational force, and the center of our planet is very dense, and we are constantly being pulled towards the center of our planet. Um, we exert a certain downward force. Um, that's what allows us to walk on our planet. That's what allows um, the air to stay where it is, to, to be you know as um, dense as it is where we're at um, it helps us breathe and so there's a lot of factors playing on that and so if we were to for example go to the moon or even Mars or any other planet the core of those planets are completely different and they have less of a gravitational pull or more of a gravitational pull depending on where you go and it's going to create a fluctuation in our weight so if we were to example to go to the moon 
there's less gravitational force being applied on us, and so we would actually end up weighing less than we do here on Earth. So understand that when we're talking about gravitational force in a downward motion, um, it's, a, it's standard here on Earth, and that's what we're going to keep it as such, but know that it varies from different location. Um, so as quantity increases, the gravitational force increases. So we're talking about that bowl of pennies. I've got more mass there. That's putting more pressure downwards, and that's going to increase um, the weight. Um, as the distance from Earth increases, gravitational force decreases. So if we go on to the top of Mount Everest, and I were to actually take a scale out and weigh myself, I'm actually going to weigh you know, significantly less than if I were at the bottom. Um, I mean, it may be a pound, it may be two pounds. I don't know what the difference is. You could probably calculate it, but know that the further away we're getting, the less we're going to weigh. That's why astronauts in space <coughs> are able to float because there is no mass or center of mass like the planet holding them in place. And so they just float around doing their thing. Um, we have our U.S. customary units. We talked about those a little bit. Um, we have the, um, we talked about standard measurement, um, the foot and the pound, and then we have the ounces, with, there's um, 16 ounces in a pound, and then there's 2,000 pounds in a ton. Um, ounces are going to be critical for you guys to know. The reason being is when we're going to put refrigerant into a system, we're going to charge them via ounces. And if it's a critical system, it's, that means that we have to put in the exact amount of refrigerant that's required for that system. Um, they're very small systems, say it's like a flower cooler or something. On the side, usually, you'll find a tag. And that tag will say that this system requires two pounds, three ounces. Okay, well, I know what two pounds are, but what's an ounce? Well, there's 16 ounces into a pound. Okay, so now I know that I'm going to put in two pounds, so that's 24 ounces, plus an additional three ounces, so now I know that I'm at 27. They may also tell you that the system is full of 70 ounces. Okay, well, I have to charge my system based on that. And so when I charge the system, I put my refrigerant jug onto a scale, and the scale is going to either increase or decrease depending on how much refer which direction the refrigerant is going and I'm going to be able to know that how to put in two pounds three ounces into my system by using a scale. If I don't use a scale there's no way for me to know how much really went in there. Was it two pounds, five pounds, fifteen pounds? Who's to say? So um, we can do the same with um, the, the international units um, using grams and kilograms, but here in the States, we usually stick to our standard measurement. <clears throat> so density, the amount of a substance within a given amount of space. So it's mass per size. Um, the, uh, trying to think of the best way to really explain that one for you guys. So if I were to just um, take that bowl of pennies, and I were to um, stack them individually, one, two, three high, and then I go over to the next one, and I stack four or five, and then I um, take the next, and I stack them six high, we can see that I'm exerting more pressure um, downwards, you know, just like we talked about. Um, but let's just say if I were to take two pennies, melt them together, they're going to create um, a, the same amount of weight. You know what? I'm, this one's escaping me, guys. I'll have to come back to it. I wish I could come up with a better uh, scenario for you right now. Um, so we have the U.S. customary pounds per cubic foot. Um, so when we're talking about uh, cubic foot, we're going to talk about 12 inches, so we're going to talk about 12 inches going one direction, we're going to talk about 12 inches going in the opposite direction, 
And then we're going to also do 12 inches in a third direction. So think of it as a, as, as a room. I have my wall. I have my wall that's adjoining it. And then I also have the ceiling height. So if one room is 10 foot wide, and then the other wall is 10 foot wide, and then my <coughs> ceiling is 10 foot, so I would multiply 10 by 10 by 10, and that's going to give me, what is that, 1,000 cubic feet? So now I've got 1,000 cubic feet in that space. Um, cubic feet is going to be something that you're going to have to understand um, because we're going to be talking about gases and how they really um, take all that cubic feet and they cram it into a jug and, and so forth. And then we're going to take that jug and try to put that into a system. When we're comparing the densities of gases, it is common to use their specific volumes. So the next slide does a good job of this. So the volume of a specific amount of gas under standard conditions. So this is actually a, a really good uh, illustration of densities and specific volume. So if we're talking about carbon dioxide, if we fill up a balloon and it's at 8.1 cubic feet, so that's how much uh, space we're filling up inside that balloon of carbon dioxide, that balloon's going to weigh one pound or it's going to lift one pound. Okay, um, I think in this illustration they're saying it just weighs one pound. If we have air, it's going to have to fill up 13.454 cubic feet to weigh one pound. So carbon dioxide per cubic foot has a greater amount of mass and it's exerting more pressure downward. Okay, it's like... Um, trying to put something on top of water. A piece of wood's gonna float, but if you put a piece of gold on top, it's gonna drop down. Why? Why? Because the gold has a greater density and it's gonna break that surface tension and it's gonna drop on down. So different gases have the same principle. They all have different densities, a different amount of weight to them. And so when we're talking about ammonia, we have 21 cubic feet to one pound and then hydrogen. 178.9 cubic feet for one pound. So hydrogen is very light. Um, it really doesn't take up very much space. And so it's extremely high in our atmosphere. Um, the one thing to note too, when they're telling you about these different weights, it's all based on standard conditions. So we have 68 degrees Fahrenheit, or we have 14.7 PSIA which means pressure per square inch atmospheric. Why is that important? Well, as we go on through class and we go through the subsequent tractors, you're gonna learn that temperature is going to affect how um, the molecules react and how the molecules react are, is going to either increase or decrease the cubic feet. Um, and the same thing with pressure. You know, pressure is also gonna have an effect on how much cubic feet is um, is available for, for example, the carbon dioxide. Um, if I were to decrease the pressure, well then carbon dioxide may weigh less because of that pressure. Um, so we have to keep that um, standard uh, for just this experiment because there's gonna be a lot of changes and a lot of fluctuations if I change either of those variables. So specific gravity is the ratio of a mass of a certain volume of a liquid or solid compared to the mass of an equal volume of water. So when I was talking about that uh, piece of gold, water has a specific gravity of one. If I put a piece of wood on there and it decides to float, well, I'm gonna have a specific gravity less than one. Like that surface tension, I'm not breaking it because the object that I'm placing on it just wants to stay above it. But if I drop that gold in there, well, then it's going to sink because that piece, that object has a greater um, density. So the ratio of the mass of a certain volume of a gas compared to the mass of an equal volume of hydrogen. Okay, so what does that mean? We're basically just comparing 
um, the weight of something, the mass, against um, a container of hydrogen. Yet again, we have the same standard conditions, 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 14.7 PSIA. At equal temperatures, pressures, and volumes, two different gases should have equal number of molecules. So that is Avogadro's law. I hope I'm saying that right. So we have force, okay? <clears throat> Energy applied to matter that causes a change in velocity. All right, so we're talking about U.S. Um, units. We're talking about a pound force, or LB with the F at the bottom. So on Earth, one pound is going to exhibit a certain downward force, all right? For our um, discussion here, we're going to be talking about it as a standard. So it's just one pound of force on Earth. If we take that same one pound weight and we put it on the Earth, we're going to have one-sixth the pound force. So the moon has less gravitational pull, and therefore that one pound isn't going to put down as much weight on it as possible. So if we were to put that one pound on a scale on the moon, it would literally weigh one-sixth. Or if we were to take a one pound weight that weighs one pound on the moon, and we bring that to Earth, and we weigh it, it will be six pounds. <clears throat> so work. Work is the force multiplied by the distance traveled. Okay, so that's the foot per pound. Um, the formula is work equals force times distance. So what does that mean? We're going to move that one pound weight one foot. By moving that one pound weight by one foot, that's going to tell us what our work is. So power, rate at which work is performed. We have this formula here. Power equals work divided by time. So we can calculate how much power we are able to use. So we're moving 550 pounds one second, and we're also going to lift it up uh, one foot. Heat, cold, and temperature. Heat is the energy causing motion in atoms. As the temperature increases, atoms move rapidly. As temperature decreases, atoms slow down. Absolute zero is the absence of all heat. So now we're starting to get into the nitty gritty of refrigeration and how it all works. So refrigeration is the process of removing heat from a place that it's not wanted to a place where it makes no difference. So what does that mean? Um, we're taking, let's just talk about a refrigerator. Our refrigerator inside is nice and cold. And how does it get nice and cold? Well, we're taking the heat that's inside that refrigerator and we're pumping it outside via our refrigeration process. And so why does that matter? Well, we have different molecules, all right? These molecules, the matter, they all react differently based on the temperature. And so if we see a block of ice that's in that, fr or that freezer, for example, if it's in the fridge, it's solid, all right? There is no heat associated with it because we're going to grab it and we're going to say, hey, this thing is cold. And so those atoms inside are moving very slowly. They're still moving around, but they're not moving as fast as they potentially could be. And so as we start to apply heat to that piece of ice, well, now all of a sudden the molecules start to energize and those molecules start moving around. And when they start moving around, what ends up happening is we all of a sudden start to see that this piece of ice starts to melt and it starts to change shape and now all of a sudden becomes water. Now when it's in a water state these molecules are moving in a much more rapid um, progression until we you know start to see another change of state. Once we see another change of state now all of a sudden these molecules move so rapidly that they are so excited that they start to turn into a gaseous state which is then steam. 
So understand that molecule movement is very critical into um, how everything is going to work. Cold is the result of moving heat. So think of again, we're not making something cold, all right? We're taking heat and bringing it somewhere else. So we're transferring heat, all right? So if we grab that cold pop can out of that fridge and we're grabbing it and it feels nice and cold, well, what's happening is we're not getting that cold absorbed into our hand. That pop can is absorbing heat from our hand into the pop can, okay? So it's always heat. Heat is being moved, all right? Temperature, it's a measure of heat intensity. So how, how much heat am I really lacking inside the pop can? You know, that's, that's really what's, you know, what the question is. Um, temperature and heat are not interchangeable. Uh, does not give the amount of heat energy in the substance, and heat energy equals temperature times mass. So these are our molecules, all right? We can see that we're, when we're in cold air, you know, we're still in a vapor state, but our molecules just aren't moving very fast. They're just slowly bunched up here together, just bouncing off each other, not doing much, okay? When we have a nice hot day, these molecules are flying all over the place, all right? The air is just too dense when we're talking about cold air, and we're not going to get you know, very much um, movement out of this. If you guys are golfers, you'll realize that on a cold day, your ball isn't going to fly as far. Why? There's just too much restriction. There's just too many molecules too close together, and that golf ball just isn't going to want to fly. Versus on the hot day, that ball is going to fly a mile. So we have temperature scales um, when we're talking about um, checking for, you know, the heat or absence of heat. Uh, we have the Fahrenheit scale, which is what we use. You know, the weatherman is going to tell us stuff in Fahrenheit all the time. He's incorrect, but at least he's going to try. We also have the Celsius or the centigrade scale, the Rankin, um, Fahrenheit absolute. Um, zero Rankin equals negative 460. Um, Kelvin, Celsius absolute okay at negative 273 degrees celsius um honestly just know that they do exist i'm not going to test you guys on any of this stuff um the, the only thing that you really may see when you get out into the field um even for your own personal benefit is you may see celsius um if you go to another country or whatever um you may have to do conversion or um just to be able to see, you know, if they're talking about it's going to be 20 Celsius outside, well, I got to figure out what 20 Celsius is, and um, it's not too complicated to do. But um, so here's just some examples of how the temperature relationship um, corresponds to each other. Um, so we have the boiling temperature of water, it's 212 Fahrenheit, 672 Rankin, 373 Kelvin, and 100 Celsius. Um, the Celsius scale is really nice because it just goes from 0 to 100 when we're talking about from uh, boiling point to freezing point. Um, and then we're going to drop down to 32. 32 is our freezing wa for water versus the Celsius being 100. And then after that, we just drop all the way down to negative 460. Kelvin, Rankin both say 0. Uh, Celsius is negative 273. The thing about absolute zero is that's when all motion ceases, all right? Um, nothing moves. That's it. There's absolutely no heat available, and if there's no heat available, everything just stops. Um, luckily, we don't have to worry about that on Earth because we can't really obtain an absolute zero. Um, even in lab environments, they're very hard. It's very hard for them to achieve that. Um, they get very close, but I don't think they can really obtain it. Um, the only place that you can really see that is out in space, all right? We have no um, gravity holding matter in place, and so there's the absence of uh, heat, there's absence of matter, and so therefore we have absolute zero. So when we talk about our temperature surrounding us, we're talking about the ambient temperature. Um, 
often used in reference to an air-cooled condenser, a motor, or other compound. So that's actually going to be critical to know what ambient temperature is, because when you're charging an air conditioning system, you have the condenser, the unit that sits outside, and there's going to be a time where you're going to have to know what the temperature surrounding that unit is, okay? Um, it's critical to know what that temperature is because it's going to play into how to properly charge that system. If you don't know what that temperature is, well, it's sort of almost like a guessing game, and you may incorrectly um, charge that system up. So just know that when we're outside, that temperature surrounding us, uh, what we can sense with our, with our skin, what we sense with that thermometer, that's our ambient temperature at that time. Um, it may affect system efficiency or tr trip safety devices. So if our ambient temperature is extremely high, let's just say it's Arizona, it's 120, 130 degrees, well, that may be too hot for that system to handle, and we may have that system shut off to protect itself. Um, same thing if we're talking about server rooms or uh, control rooms for elevators. If those rooms get too hot, well, the system's going to shut down. Ambient temperature may not be consistent, constant, especially outdoors. We all know this. We all live in Chicago, all right? One second, it's 80 degrees. The next second, it's negative 30. Um, so there's always going to be a change. Uh, different conditions play a factor into what that temperature is. So sunshine, rain, snow, wind, um, all, you know, play a big part. Um, if we're testing our systems, make sure it's in a neutral location. Um, if I have my therm thermometer outside and I'm testing next to the condenser, well, I'm going to try to keep it in the shade. Um, or if I can. Um, we're trying to maximize any inconsistencies as possible. So we also have specific heat capacity. And what that is, that's the amount of heat added or released to change temperature. So the U.S. customary heat amount to, to change temperature of one pound of substance by one degree Fahrenheit. So what that means is how much heat do we have to put into a substance for it to change temperature, okay? And so we have a little chart off to the side here, and it's just telling us, you know, how much, you know, uh, BTUs I need per pound degree Fahrenheit. So what that means is I, for example, ice, I need 0.504 BTUs per pound to change it one degree. BTUs are British thermal units, and that's what we here in the States use when we're talking about heat energy or cooling energy, all right? Oh, let me go back here. Um, water is just at a solid one. Um, liquid ammonia, that's a 1.1, so we know that there's a lot more um, heat required to change those, um, that temperature, versus alcohol, bricks, copper, um, they take, require less heat energy. So if we were to take a thermometer and the temperature is 63 degrees, we're going to turn on our burner, we're going to apply heat to it, and after we apply um, one BTU, that's how much heat we've just applied to the water, our temperature is going to increase to 64 degrees, okay? If we do it on the uh, international side, we're going to have one kilogram of water, we're going to add uh, kilojoules, 4.187 kilojoules, and that's going to give me uh, increase of one degree Celsius. Okay, um, I don't care about international so much as I do about the standard. So we have to understand that you know we're adding one BTU of heat to the water to rate, to increase it by one degree. So now this leads us to enthalpy. Enthalpy is the total amount of heat in a substance, and that's calculated from reference temperature. 
So water, water vapor calculations are 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Refrigerant calculations are negative 40. So we have a formula here. Um, enthalpy equals the mass of a substance times the specific heat of the substance equals the difference between measured and reference temperatures. So why is this important? Well, when we're going into a building, we want to understand how much heat is inside that building. Well, we need to know what the heat requirement is to properly heat that space, and we need to know what the cooling requirement is to cool that space, okay? So when we're talking about heating, we're going to apply heat into the space, and cooling, we're gonna remove the heat from that space. Moisture is going to have an effect on that air content. And so understanding how much heat is in that air is going to pl play a factor into how much cooling we will need. Have, how much moisture is in that air will have an effect on how much heating we will need. And so when we're talking about winter time, when we, well, even let me backtrack. The easiest way to describe that for you guys is when you guys are out and you're working and it's 80 degrees outside, 100% humidity, it's miserable, all right? Nobody wants to be outside. But when we talk about 80 degrees and it's 0% humidity, well, then we're all comfy and we really enjoy that. And so there's a heat content in the air. And so what we as human beings have, we have our skin and our skin perceives things differently. So each person, you go into a different home, it's going to feel slightly different to you than it does to somebody else because grandma likes it at 80 degrees. You know, maybe us, you know, uh, younger folk, we like it at uh, 72. Um, so that's going to change from one home to home. The next thing is putting in a humidifier, all right? If we put in a humidifier into that space, now we're starting to add heat into that space, all right? We're making those molecules move around a little bit more, and that heat is then going to transfer through um, the air, and it's going to allow for us to feel warmer in that space instead of having this dry heat um, that really makes it very arid, um, static electricity, issues with hair, um, just all kinds of other issues, you know, and the nice humidity range is supposed to be 30 to 60 percent. We maintain that, we get less bacteria, we don't get sick as much, so there's definitely added benefits. When we're talking about air conditioning, now all of a sudden we have this moist air and it's just nasty and muggy, and we're trying to remove that from that space, and so we have the air conditioner running, and the nice thing is we're getting this cold air being blasted in there, but at the same time, we're taking this moist air, we're hitting something that's very cold, and we're causing it to condense, all right? We're getting water to form on the outside of our evaporator. It's like taking that pop can out of a fridge and putting it on a hot summer table. It starts to sweat. Well, what's happening is that air surrounding that pop can it's hitting that pop can, that heat is being absorbed into the pop, and in turn, we're losing all that moisture that's in the air, and it's starting to condense. And so we're taking that heat energy, and we're transferring it to something else. And honestly, that is just enthalpy, and that's why it's important to know, um, because we're going to want to remove all that moisture out of the air um, when we're talking about air conditioning systems. If I put in a bunch of cold air into a place and I don't remove that moisture, well, guess what? I'm going to have a cool but muggy environment and nobody wants that. So we also ha we have the specific enthalpy, the enthalpy per unit of mass. And that's measured in BTUs per pound of kilojoules per kilogram. All right, so, all right, we have the formula. Specific enthalpy is the enthalpy BTUs times uh, or divided by mass. And then we have three different types of heat transfer. 
So we have radiation, conduction, and convection. And so off, off on the left, we have um, just an image of like a, like a space heater uh, that you may find in a bathroom. Um, in the middle, we just have a stove top. Um, and then we have um, convection and on the right, and that is just like a uh, little blower wheel just to help circulate air through. <sighs> transfer. What we're really talking about here is how energy moves, specifically heat energy, and how it gets from point A to point B, whether it be here on the surface of the Earth, up in the atmosphere, or even out in space. Heat transfer occurs really in three ways, and these include conduction, convection, and radiation. Let's take a look at each of these, starting with conduction. This is heat transfer as a result of molecular contact. The best way to understand conduction is by thinking about an example. So here I have a metallic spoon, and I imagine holding a match underneath it. Now what we know is that that spoon is gonna heat up, and not just the part of the spoon that's over the match, but rather the spoon as a whole. And the reason this happens is because of conduction. Energy from the flame is causing the molecules within the spoon to vibrate, and that's transferring energy from one to the next to the next to the next until the entire spoon has warmed up. That heat has transferred throughout the entire material. Conduction is going to happen most effectively in solid materials. But let's not forget about convection and radiation. Let's look at convection. This is heat transfer through or as a result of density differences. Again, let's grab that match and let's think about this for a minute. I think we all know it's probably not the best idea to hold your hand above an open flame like this. And that's because a lot of the heat energy generated by that flame is gonna rise. That is purely because of the process of convection. You see what's happening is the flame is causing the air to expand. And when it expands, it becomes less dense than the surrounding air and therefore floats upwards. And with it goes some of that heat energy. That's what convection is all about. And this is going to occur most effectively within liquids and gases. Finally, let's think about radiation. Radiation is heat transfer by wave motion. Let's pull that flame up one more time. I think we know that because of convection, heat is going to rise, but it's also going to travel outwards in the form of waves of energy, electromagnetic waves. And that's the third type of heat transfer. Radiation is really interesting in that it doesn't need a material for it to travel. So this can occur out in open, empty space. In fact, this is how energy travels from Earth's sun to the surface of the Earth. And so if we look back, we have our three types of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. And it's important to know the key word that goes with each one. For convection, it's going to be density differences. For conduction, it's going to be contact. And for radiation, it's going to be waves. We can sum all three types of heat transfer up in one diagram by looking at something as simple as a campfire. Imagine that you're camping and you hold a pot of water or stew above that flame. Well, right now in this one picture, we are seeing all three types of heat transfer take place. There's conduction happening as the flame is transferring energy directly to and throughout the pot as a result of molecular contact. Additionally, there's convection as heat from both the boiling pot and the flame itself is rising up as a result of density differences. And finally, there's radiation occurring all around the campfire as energy travels away from the flame in the form of electromagnetic waves. And that's a quick look at heat transfer. Yeah, so that was just a quick little video on the different ways of heat transfer. But what we have is uh, we've got radiation, you know, heat transferred by heat rays. 
Um, heated surfaces lose, lose heat through radiation. Cold surfaces absorb radiated heat. So when we put in you know, insulation into a home, we're trying to mitigate that uh, heat loss. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stop that you know, radiation, the conduction, the convection, all you know, from really occurring. Um, so we have the conduction, we have the flow of heat due to molecular vibrations. Um, heat insulators conduct heat poorly. And then convection, movement of heat by way of liquid or gas. And that brings us, you know, to the states of matter. We have the physical state of a substance depends on temperature, pressure, and heat content. So back to that, you know, uh, the 68 degrees with the 14.7 atmospheric pressure, those are all critical because um, that's going to have an effect on matter, all right? As we talk about this, you'll start to see the, the difference in why that is. So... Um, if we have a solid, okay, um, let's just say this is, is water. All these molecules are very tightly packed together. They're not moving very much, and so we get that hard mass when we're talking about a piece of ice. In a water, in a state, you know, for H2O, and we're in a just its regular state, we've got the molecules bouncing around, doing their thing. Um, they're fluid, but they're not completely um, free. When we have gas, the molecules are much further away and they're free to bounce around and, and do their thing. And that's why we have um, different ways for um, the steam and the water to really do its thing. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when we're talking about molecules. So a solid keeps its shape even when not contained, all right? So if we make a, uh, I, I guess technically jello would be considered a solid. If we were to put that into a container, we pull the container out and we put the piece of jello onto you know, our countertop, well, that jello is going to retain its shape. Uh, liquid has a definite, definite volume, but no definite shape. All right? If we take jello and it, before we mix it and let it harden, we put that on the counter, it's just going to spill all over the place. All right. It's going to take the shape of its container. Well, if we have no container, we're just going to have a mess because it's going to be all over our countertop. And then gas. Gas has no definite shape or volume. All right. It expands to fill its container. Well, depending on how large a container we have, that could be the entire room. It could be a balloon. It could be, you know, whatever the case may be, or it could just be the entire environment. All right. So latent heat. All right. This is important to understand what latent heat is, and then we're going to get into sensible heat. Heat that causes a change of state with no change in temperature, okay? So when we have a change of state, when we're going from a liquid to a gas, or if we're going from, let's just say, a piece of ice to liquid, there's a certain amount of heat energy that is transferred between the products, but you can't measure it, okay? Um, if I were to take a glass, fill it with water, and put a thermometer in there, what's it going to read, okay? It's going to read 32 degrees, all right? This thermometer is in Celsius, but... It's going to read 32 degrees, and it's going to continue to read 32 degrees until all of my ice melts. Well, why? What, what's happening? We know that the ice is melting, all right? I'm putting a heat source underneath it, whether it's a hot plate, a heat gun, who cares, a match. But ice, the, the heat energy from that source that I'm giving it is being absorbed into the ice. That ice is starting to turn... Um, its shape into a water, all right? So we're starting to get a change of state, but the temperature doesn't change. Why? Well, we're putting heat energy into the, into the molecules, and it's causing them to change its shape. Not until all the ice melts does the temperature start to go up. And the same is also true for when, from going from a, uh, a liquid 
to a vapor. We need to put so much heat energy into water at 212 degrees for it to go from a water to a vapor. So we have a graph here illustrating that, okay? So at zero degrees, all right, um, we're at, or I'm sorry, at negative 40 right here on the scale, um, and that is in Celsius, so we'll just keep it as such. Um, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really change until we get up to point B, all right? Point B is going to be 32 degrees, okay? That's the point at which ice um, takes shape. So if I were to uh, start to freeze an object, well, it's gonna turn into ice. If I add heat to a piece of ice, it's going to melt. So in this example, we're gonna go from an ice all the way up to steam. And so what ends up happening is, as we start to apply heat, apply heat to an object that's at absolute zero or negative 40 or whatever the case may be, we're gonna see that at 32 degrees, there's a certain amount of heat energy that is being absorbed by the object before it's able to change shape. Once it's able to change shape, we can put a thermometer into the glass of water and we can see the temperature rise. But from point B to C, we're not able to see the temperature change. Our thermometer is just going to keep reading 32 degrees, but we know that heat energy is being applied. And so that's called latent heat. And then the same applies once I get up to 212 degrees. Before my water turns to steam, it has to absorb all this latent heat before it finally becomes steam. And so this is important to know because when we're talking about refrigeration systems, we're talking about air conditioning, there's a certain amount of sensible heat that we're going to have or we're going to have some latent heat, all right? We're going to have that latent heat that's needed to transform the vapor that's in the air, the water molecules, into a liquid form, okay? And so that's going to take a certain amount of energy from our refrigeration system, and we need to understand what the difference between sensible and latent heat. And so we have, how did we come up with um, a ton of refrigeration, okay? So basically, what wound up happening was um, we used to have pieces of ice, okay? The giant pieces of ice would sit inside big rooms and they would keep things cold. And so one day somebody decided that, you know what, I want to determine how long it's going to take, you know, for this piece of ice to melt, all right? And they basically calculated out that um, how much heat energy is absorbed when a ton of ice melts during one 24-hour day, okay? And so they determined that 2,000 pounds times 144 BTUs per pound divided by 24 hours, it's going to give me... 12,000 BTUs an hour. So, if I were to have a space, and we'll just keep it very simple, I have a 10 by 10 room, I do a load calculation, and it says that, hey, I need 12,000 BTUs an hour to maintain a certain temperature inside that room. I can do one of two things. I can put in an air conditioning system that's gonna give me 12,000 BTUs of cooling capacity, and that can just run endlessly, or I can put one ton piece of ice in there and I will be comfortable for 24 hours. Um, after the ice melts and all the heat energy is absorbed, I'm going to have a big puddle of water. So either I can have an air conditioning system that's going to continue to give me heat, or I have a swimming pool. The choice is yours, but I'm going to go with air conditioning system. Hey there guys, Paul here from the engineeringmindset.com. In this video, we're going to be understanding the term refrigeration ton. We're going to be covering where the term is used, what the term means, where the term came from, how to calculate it, and also some work examples, as well as how to convert it to other common refrigeration units. 
Now, the term refrigeration tongue is commonly used in North America, and it's a unit of measurement for the cooling capacity of a refrigeration machine. It has a few variants, and it's sometimes called a ton of refrigeration, or just RT for short. The term refrigeration tongue is a little bit confusing to many people. It has nothing to do with the weight of the machine. It only relates to the amount of cooling that the machine can produce. The term used to be used in many other countries, but the majority of the world has switched over to SI metric units or kilowatts of cooling. However, some people and manufacturers will still refer to equipment rated in refrigeration tons. If you're outside North America and have some older refrigeration equipment on site, then this will likely be noted in refrigeration tons. If you're working in North America, then you will often see large refrigeration plants, such as chillers, referred to in refrigeration tons. For a smaller unit... No, oh, sorry about that, guys. I'm just going to move this over here. Doing split screen. ...are typically rated in BTUs. If you'd like to learn how chillers work, then check out our other videos on that subject. There's a link in the top right corner now. And you can check out some of our previous videos where we cover everything from how air and water cool chillers work, split AC units, heat pumps and VRF units, etc, etc. The list goes on. Do check those out. Now, the term refrigeration ton came about in the late 1800s. This is when blocks of ice were used in air handles to provide cooling. They would literally order blocks of ice by the ton. This would then sit directly in the flow of the warmer supply air, which melted it and carried the cold air away into the building. So a ton of ice would provide a ton of cooling, and the equivalent amount of cooling later became available through vapor compression refrigeration machines. So a ton of refrigeration is how much heat needs to be removed from a US short ton of water to turn it into ice within 24 hours. This is only for the latent heat, so the water would need to be at 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and the ice would then also still be at 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is only the energy to cause a phase change of the water to turn it from a liquid into a solid, so from water into ice. If the water was at room temperature, then you would need to remove more heat to bring it down to 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, before it can be turned into ice. Let's look at some calculations for this in the modern units for both metric and imperial. So a short ton is equal to 907 kilograms or 2,000 pounds. The latent heat of fusion for ice is 334 kilojoules per kilogram or 144 BTUs per pound. So to calculate the latent heat cooling load, just multiply the respective units together. So to convert this weight of water into ice within 24 hours, on the metric side, we're going to need to extract 303,845 kilojoules, or in BTUs, 288,000. To find our hourly rate of cooling, we just need to divide this number by 24 hours. So on the metric side, 303,845 kilojoules divided by 24 hours equals 12,660.21 kilojoules per hour. And then on the imperial side, 288,000 BTUs divided by 24 hours will give us 12,000 BTUs per hour. Now for the metric units, since kilowatts is a rate of power based on joules per second, we need to divide 12,660.21 kilojoules by how many seconds there are in an hour. So if there's 60 minutes in an hour, multiplied by 60 seconds per minute, that will give us 3,600 seconds per hour. So if we divide 12,660.21 kilojoules by 3,600 seconds per hour, then that gives us 3.52 kilowatts. So to convert to other common refrigeration units, you can see on the screen here, I've just shown some work examples for how to convert between refrigeration tons and kilowatts, as well as between refrigeration tons and BT. So I'm going to pause it right here for a second. Um, the nice thing here is when we're talking about air conditioning systems, they're going to come in tons, okay? Um, how many tons do I need for a space? Uh, three ton, four ton, five ton. Uh, if we get into larger commercial units, five, you know, 10 ton plus. Um, so what we have to understand and what you guys need to remember is we have 12,000 BTUs is equal to one ton, all right? So if I were to take 
three, all right, three RTs times 12,000, that's going to give me 36,000, okay? So three tons is equal to a 36,000 BTU system. And so generally our systems, they're going to come in one ton and half ton increments, okay? I'm going to be able to buy a two ton, I'm going to buy a two and a half, a three, three and a half, four, um, up to a five ton for residential. Um, when we're talking commercial, it's going to be a little bit different, but then they're going to go in one ton increments. If we talk about ductless mini splits, all right, those are the units that are going to hang in your room um, right above, you know, the space. Um, they're going to provide you different cooling capacities, and they can actually go into quarter ton increments. So we can get a 6,000 BTU system, which would be a half a ton. We can then go into a 9,000 BTUs, a three-quarter ton. Um, usually, we're just going to talk about um, how many BTUs are required at that point uh, when we're talking about mini splits, 16 or 15, 18, 12, whatever the case may be. When we're talking about um, standardized systems, we're going to talk about the tonnage, two and a half, two ton, three ton, so forth. Wow. Now, I won't go into the calculations for these. You can just pause the video uh, if you want to view these a bit longer and make any notes, but they're fairly easy to follow. Okay, that is it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. All right, so um, so that's basically matter and tonnage in a nutshell here.